teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Literacy Podcast. Melissa and Lori love literacy. We are very pumped for our guest today. Um, She is going to drop so much knowledge about, well, lots of things, but I think in particular, decodables is going to be a hot topic we're going to talk about, as well as we're going to talk a little bit about sound balls, which Melissa and I have been seeing all over social media, right, Melissa? That's right. (laughs) What the heck are sound balls? This is like a new thing. Um, So, Besides all of that, she's a brilliant researcher, <laughs> and we can't wait to hear from her. So, Julia, welcome to the show. Welcome, Julia. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes. Yeah. Was recommended by Nell Duke, so that's a high honor. <laughs> yes, indeed it is. <laughs> and, and, Julia, I feel like you're wise beyond your years, too. Like, I just... Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. After, <laughs> after, after talking with you in the pre-meeting, I was like, oh, we got to set aside a huge chunk of time to talk to her because I want to know everything in her brain. So <laughs> welcome to the show. We're very grateful you're here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'd love to. So my name is Julia Lindsay, as you've introduced me as, and I just recently finished my PhD at the University of Michigan where I was in the education school studying literacy, language, and culture. So while I was at U of M, I studied a lot of different ways that we can help teachers and early readers have a really excellent experience with early reading. Um, And the reason I got into that was because I actually taught kindergarten and first grade in New York City um, right after graduating college. And I loved everything about teaching, but I really, really love teaching reading and also writing. Um, And when I was teaching reading, though, I often got kind of stuck um, on certain kids. I would be like, I just don't get it. Like, here we are in phonics, (laughs) they're getting a 100% on all of their tests. And then I give them a text and they just like have no idea what they're doing. And as a new teacher who didn't have tons of experience or tons of knowledge, I often just didn't know what to do. Um, And I would just sit there and keep saying, sound it out, sound it out. And then I (laughs) found out a word myself and realized like, that didn't make any sense. That's not Mm. what I thought it was. Like I would just get very confused about what I was trying to tell kids to do. And I kind of tucked that away in my brain and thought, you know, I'll learn better Other teachers are experts in doing this a lot better than me. Um, And then actually, when I came to grad school, I realized, oh, this is actually a problem a lot of people are having. Like, there's this real weird disconnect between phonics and reading that um, happens in, in the early years. And I was really floored by how many other people I heard had encountered the same kind of disconnect. Um, And that at that point, I started getting really interested in how we could really support kids in word recognition and in using um, all of the skills that we teach them in phonics to read text. And that kind of led me into studying decodable texts um, and working with big districts to to understand their impact and how they work for kids and to make better decodable texts, um, as well as working on a number of early reading curricula dealing with uh, mostly foundational skills work, but also some comprehension building as we, of course, need to be doing as well. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> I'm wondering, Angelia, because you know I'm the secondary person, so I'm going to ask all the questions of like people that might not be <laughs> uh, very skilled in teaching the K2 reading world. So um, can you just start by telling us like what does decodables or decodability even mean? Like what, what are we talking about there? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's something that we all need to kind of wrap our heads around. So the main thing to realize is that when we start thinking about like what is decodability and why are we even talking about it, we really need to stop and go back to asking ourselves, what are we actually aiming to accomplish in early reading instruction? So we know that in the first couple of years of school, we're all committed to phonics. We have decades of evidence telling us that phonics is efficient and effective and a way for kids to learn the basics of our written language system so that they can make connections between spelling patterns and sounds. And then uh, more recently, but also, you know, we have research on this for several decades as well. We've had an increased understanding about the importance of phonemic awareness. 
In particular, we know that kids really benefit from explicit instruction and practice dealing with those individual phonemes, those individual sounds and words, and then blending and segmenting phonemes to make words or write words. So if we think about building off of both phonics and phonemic awareness, that's when we come to decoding. So decoding is using the correspondences between spellings and pronunciations to read words. So early in reading, decoding is mostly about using graphing phoneme relationships to read individual words. So knowing the relationship between C, A, and T, and K, at, and then reading cat. So decoding is a process of super strong readers. Even the most proficient adult readers pay attention to all of the letters in a word, even though it's subconscious, and don't have to rely on context. So we know that decoding is the most efficient and effective way to recognize an unknown word. Decoding also supports our readers in generating orthographic maps, another hot topic, these memory maps, yes. <laughs> pronunciation, spellings, and meanings of words. So it supports, in the moment, decoding supports word recognition, and longer term, it supports word recognition and automaticity. So in other words, what are we aiming to accomplish in early reading instruction and in phonics? Well, it's actually decoding is what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to teach kids random phonics facts or random phonemic awareness facts. No, to be frank, nobody cares. Like, it doesn't matter if you know these like weird things, but you can't do anything with them. So the whole point of this teaching and the push around this that I think that a lot of times kind of gets missing in some of our conversations where we're talking about like the very small times of day. Well, the critical part is actually the application and the actual act of using these tools to decode words, and in particular, to decode them in context. So that's what brings us to decodables and why those kind of matter and why all of this is wrapped up together. Because decodables give us the clearest, easiest way for children to apply phonics and phonemic awareness in a meaningful context and to actually build on that skill of decoding over time um, in order to become eventual fluent and automatic word readers. So that's kind of like the big picture of we have this type of instruction that we've all kind of thought about a lot, but we don't necessarily always think about the thread that's connecting all of these like explicit skills into what we're actually talking about and what we actually care about, which is reading. Um, again, nobody cares if you can tell somebody like the sound a letter makes if you don't know what to do with that. So giving kids the opportunity to do something with that um, is like the beauty of what a decodable can do. That's great. Oh, I have so many more questions for you. I'm <laughs> no, gonna, I'm going to let Lori go first. <laughs> Lori, go ahead, because I'm going to ask her like a million things. <laughs> no, it's okay. So what I'm hearing you say is that decoding is not the end game. Understanding text, comprehending text is the end game. And um, sometimes in K2, we might pause at decoding, but we really need to push through to really think through that whole, why are we doing this? Is that accurate, Julia? Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely like the next part. I think the first thing to recognize is phonics isn't the goal. The second thing to recognize is like decoding isn't really the goal either. And then the third thing is like, it's really about making meaning. And I think that the, the reason why we need to still focus on these two things, phonics, phonemic awareness, decoding, all of these things that aren't the goal is because they let us get to the goal in the most efficient, effective way possible where kids actually have the ability to use their own knowledge to recognize words, to learn new words, um, rather than having to rely so much on other factors. So yes, the goal is always making meaning, but we need to be cognizant of the steps along the way to that. And we also need to recognize that kids are making meaning all the time. Just because a child is learning to read does not mean that they can't read to learn. They can do all of these things at once. And in fact, they are doing these things at once. No human is not trying to understand what's happening around them. So even when a child is just at the early stages of learning to read, they can still build knowledge and understandings. Maybe not so much from the exact text that they're in, but from the context surrounding it, they certainly can. Can I ask a question going like the opposite direction? Because I was a secondary teacher. And so, sure. you know, what I've been thinking or what I thought my entire time teaching was that, you know, in the in middle school and high school, we focus primarily on comprehension, right? Like the actual like curriculum focuses primarily on comprehension. But in my mind, I've always thought, well, I, I don't want to necessarily back up to these like 
you know, skills from elementary school, but if they are still struggling <laughs> with decoding the words or at least doing it fluently, um, they're having a lot more trouble comprehending. Um, not everyone always agreed with me on that. So I'm just throwing that out there. as like <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we know that a lot of challenges in reading are related to this inability to recognize words. And that's um, not, that doesn't mean that a child doesn't know like basic alphabet correspondences. Right. They might have a hang up that's much further along. It might not even be single syllable words. They might really need support in reading multisyllabic words. Mm -hmm. But we know that a large proportion of children who have demonstrated reading difficulties also have demonstrated difficulties specifically in foundational skills. So ignoring that is not really serving anyone. Um, we also know that if a child is experiencing success in reading, so in the individual words that they're able to read, they might be more motivated to read. Um, and therefore, that actually might help them read more things, and then their reading will improve. So having kids in text and having kids in experiences where they can access actual word reading is not just critical because it's supportive of this development of word reading, but it's also helpful because it's supportive of motivation, as well as it helps kids understand vocabulary and build knowledge in other ways as well. So it's a little weird to think about secondary students needing all of these things that we hope that they get in the early grades, mm -hmm. But to completely ignore that side and say, well, they really just need support and comprehension, you might have done assessments and know that. But if you don't know that, it's worth trying to understand if they might need support in specific word reading and trying to meet their needs there as well. That's really helpful. I, I feel like I want to talk a little bit about why decodables are so important and I see all the time um, on social media and teachers that I run into talking about Talking about decodable text, like, but I, I, I'm not quite sure that we all have the same definition of decodable text. And I think that there's a lot of talk about like the types of text used for decoding practice, but maybe we're not all on the same page. So I'd love for you to shed some light on that and, and clarify and be really clear about, you know, what, what are, what are decodable texts and why are they so important? Um, and what type of text we can use for decoding practice? Like, why is this such a hot topic right now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So decodable texts, very basically, are texts that have a high proportion of words that a child has learned to decode in phonics. So they have known sound spelling correspondences and known high frequency words. So one critical aspect of the definition I just shared is that I said, to a child, right? So we all know that what we teach isn't always what a child knows. So decodability is actually a function of a kid, not just a text. So we can make some assumptions based on what we've taught in phonics. We might be able to say 80% uh, of the words in this book are include letter sound relationships or sound spelling relationships that I've taught in phonics. So it should be decently decodable for a child. But if we know that child maybe has different knowledge or lesser knowledge than what we expected, that text might actually not be decodable for them. So that's kind of one important thing to think about when we start selecting texts. This definition, though, isn't the one that we've always had. So in the past, people sometimes defined decodable text as text just with a lot of regular sound spelling correspondences, um, which is way more confusing <laughs> to talk about because... <laughs> When do you know all of those? Like maybe by second grade, but um, certainly not in kindergarten. So that kind of changes what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But in general, that's what most people mean today. They mean what has a child actually learned in phonics and what high frequencies have they learned. And the reason that these are so hot right now, as they should be, is going back to what I was saying a little bit ago about um decoding and why decoding is so critical and why we need to be focusing on applying our phonics and phonemic awareness in context. So decodables give us the easiest way to do this. To be quite um, frank, like just go into your classroom library and take out a level text. Like for example, maybe you grab a level D text if you're teaching kindergarten. You're probably using these texts middle to the end of the year, maybe you're teaching children in phonics, CVC word reading and decoding. Um, maybe you're getting into like long vowel patterns, like the silent E, maybe you're doing some consonant blends. 
pretend like you only have that knowledge. Take away everything else that you know as an adult. Take away all the things that you think a kid would know based on um, experiences that they might have had in other contexts and see what words you can actually read. And just notice for yourself how many words on these pages tend to be really complicated um, and really not accessible unless you have some other thing that you're relying on. Uh, because it's not necessarily words that kids could decode using phonics. So if you kind of put yourself in that mindset and then you think to yourself, okay, if my goal is to support kids in word recognition, and we know that the best way to have word recognition is decoding, then how could they do that in this text? So the power of decodables comes in because they have been written to be controlled for those specific words that we, based on a scope and sequence, that a child should be able to decode. Most of the time, this is about 80% is like kind of the gold standard right now. That is not from research. That is kind of a random benchmark um, that was estimated by people, but we don't know from research, like what percentage of words in the text should be decodable for a kid to really be able to access it. So it depends on the kid, depends on the type of text, um, depends on, you know, all sorts of other factors. But generally, you are looking for text around 80% or more decodable to be considered really a decodable. So if yeah. we have a text like that in front of a kid and they can read 80% of the words in that text by using either their knowledge from phonics or their knowledge of high frequency words, then suddenly they're able to access that text much easier. And we know from research that children in these types of texts are going to rely less on you for prompts. They're going to actually apply decoding more often um, spontaneously, and they are more likely to be fluent over time. We also know that these texts seem to support beginning readers, which is exactly who they're designed for, and English language learners more than other types of texts. We don't have tons and tons and tons of evidence about this. So decodable texts are primarily being recommended right now based on a limited number of studies and a whole lot of theory. But um, that doesn't mean that we should shy away from them just because we don't have like, you know, a 10,000 child study on them mm -hmm. because the theory behind them is so strong. The important thing to remember, though, is that these are used for a specific point in time. Decodable texts were originally conceived of and are designed for kids who are decoding. If you have children who are not decoding because you're teaching half the second half of second grade or for certain kids, even sometimes in first grade, if there are children who are already totally reading words um, without the need to decode sound by sound uh, or, you know, chunking at all, then those children are not going to be served by decodables because the whole point is like applying letter sound relationship in text. Uh, that's not to say that those kids shouldn't have experienced these texts at all. If you have, especially if it's early on in kindergarten or something like that, you might have children who appear to be fluent readers already, but who really haven't solidified a lot of these connections because they just happen to be bringing in a ton of background knowledge. But um, all kids at these early points in reading are likely to be served by the ability to actually apply phonics and phonemic awareness to decode words in a context that holds meaning, or at least hopefully holds meaning because we all know that there are some decodables out there that are pretty questionable. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I, I, I just want to clarify real quick, Julia. So when you say that 80%, um, that's, you're saying that like 80% of the words that are in the text, the student should have the skills to be able to decode it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that like, they're going to just like know it automatically or easily, right? Like it still might, it, it might seem to a teacher like they're struggling a bit. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And that's actually something that we want to lean into instead of being afraid of. So decoding is a hard thing to do. It's a mm -hmm. cognitive challenge. And we need to recognize that it's a good cognitive challenge, not a bad one. So some teachers that I've worked with have noticed that when they make a switch from using, um, in particular, pattern-based text to decodable text, that their students' fluency actually declines mm -hmm. and that they're hearing a lot more struggle and that they're hearing kids stop on almost every single word and use the sound by sound decoding strategy to get through that word. And I would imagine some teachers then would say like, this is not the right text, right? Exactly. Like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Julia, can you, can you really quickly give us an example of a pattern text? Just mm -hmm. if for anyone listening out there who is like, I just want to confirm my understanding of a pattern text. Yeah. So something like, 
I see a cat, I see a duck, I see a dog. That's a very simple pattern text that we might see um, in certain texts often geared towards kindergarten. But there are actually a lot of texts that have a pattern. It's just more complicated. Like um, there are texts that might say uh, the ingredients for a cake are flour, sugar, butter, eggs. You can put the cake in the oven and bake it. The ingredients for a pizza are pizza sauce, pepperoni, cheese, and dough. You can put a pizza in the oven and bake it. So in fact, that's still a pattern-based text because we're still really having the um, reliance of word reading there being on a pattern plus content words that are often drawn from pictures. Got it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking earlier. You had mentioned like other factors and I was... I was inferring that maybe other factors could be personal experience of the child, pictures, things like that, that are not actually helping them to read, but that might contribute to their understanding of of the the text. Can you elaborate a little bit more on like the other factors and and maybe pattern-based text might be a part of that? Yeah. So typically when we are uh, talking about reading in the early years, we have talked a lot about children relying on things like the context, the grammar and the syntax of a sentence, the picture cues that are happening in a text um, or a picture walk preview prior to reading the text um, or even just reading after a teacher has read something and or um, relying even on the first letter to guess at a word. So all of these are strategies that children do use to read words. So we might think, okay, they use them, great. So then they should keep using them. But that's kind of um, a, that logic thread doesn't work as well when we start thinking about what the point is of sitting with a child and having them read with you. Yeah. So if we know that a child is already relying on meaning, they're already relying on context and pictures and everything else that's going around them and how you introduce the text and what they see on each page, but also across the text in order to try to figure out what's going on. We don't need to actually be constantly reminding them to do that. So we know that humans just naturally are trying to make sense of language and are try- and they then are trying to make sense of words. Mm-hmm. So we don't necessarily need to keep reminding kids to do that if most children are already doing that. For, so that's one thing. The second thing to note is that we know that that's a far less efficient strategy at recognizing words. So we actually know that poor readers are the readers who rely the most on context. Um, And so when we think about what we are teaching, why am I sitting with a child to help them read? To help them move on to something better. I'm not sitting with a child to give them a strategy they already have. I'm sitting with them to give them a better strategy. So rather than giving a child a strategy that isn't that efficient, is not going to work in any text in third grade without pictures, and is something that they're already doing, I can give them a strategy that they can use independently in any text uh, and I can help them use decoding strategies in the moment so that they're paying attention to letters, paying attention to sounds and developing a skill that's actually going to lead to independence. So the difference is really not thinking about like, do kids ever do this? Yeah, they look at cues, they look at context, they look at pictures. The question is, what is the role of instruction and how is that actually pushing a child to be better instead of kind of keeping them at, at the same place um, where they might not actually be developing skills of an independent reader. It's a really good point. And did I hear you say, Julia, that even as an adult, we're still decoding the words, even if, because I don't feel like I am, right? Like I read very quickly and I can't imagine <laughs> that I'm actually yeah. still decoding. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not decoding words that you know, um, but your eye, we've done studies not me personally, this is not the kind of research I do, but people have done studies <laughs> on adult proficient readers where they look, attract their eye movements. And mm-hmm. so we, um, for a long time, there was a debate and research about, do we recognize words as wholes or do we actually attend to the letters? And we now know that we attend to the letters and their position in relation to each other in a word to recognize it. Um, you, As an adult, you've probably seen people post things where it's like all the letters are jumbled up and you can still read it. Yeah. Yes. Your adult brain can comprehend and deal with a lot of complex situations. That <laughs> doesn't mean that what a child is doing is looking at just the first and the last letter and then making a guess about what's in the middle. So I think some of the, the confusions lie in like, 
what we're capable of versus like, what is the actual best thing that we can do instructionally to support long-term goals? So um, just because an adult reader can undo a jumbled word doesn't mean that that's actually the best strategy to try to use with kids. Right. But even for an adult, right? Like I, I can do that, but it's going to take me a lot longer yeah, to figure out the exactly. meaning of that text. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so it would be really frustrating if all the words I read were like that. <laughs> it would be. But what would be even more challenging would be if you didn't know that you didn't know it. Like, you know, like you read and you know when you don't know. Sometimes I feel like kids just go through and they think they know. And that's like the scariest point for me is when I hear a kid keep going, keep going, keep going. And they've mispronounced like several words in a row and don't pause. Like, I always feel like if you, if you know, then that's in, and you're aware and they, the kids are aware, it's so much, um, so much better because they're able to pause, but when they don't have that pause moment and they don't know that what they don't know, that's, I think when there's a bigger issue all around, like, cause you have to teach the, the child awareness that he or she doesn't understand the letter sound relationships. Like that's a big red flag to me. So Melissa, yeah, and you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely why we need to keep prompting children to use yeah. the patterns and words and to use what they know about phonics when they're trying to recognize a word. Um, so saying things like even just as simple as look at the word again um, or slide through all of those sounds. So we actually know from studies on preschoolers that children are not naturally like attending to print as much as we think that they are. Um, so without some sort of print referencing, a lot of preschoolers are just looking at all sorts of other stuff. So if we say to a child, instead of look at the picture, if we remind them to come back and look at the print instead of, uh, yeah, looking at the picture or also what happened to me all the time was looking at me. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, look at the word. Look at the word. And we remind them that they have a, the skills and strategies to actually read that word. And that's super powerful. The rub here is you can't tell them to do that and then give them a word that they have no chance of reading. Mm -hmm. And so if we are saying to a child who's just learning to read basic consonant, vowel, consonant words, oh, just look at the word and the word is playground, they might have background knowledge to rely on to read that word. They might have encountered that word so many times with their parent or so many times on um, your calendar or your schedule or at the actual playground of their sign. Maybe they just happen to already know that word. But if they don't, then you're basically setting them up to not be able to use their own independent strategies. So that brings us back to why having words that are decodable in a decodable text is so helpful and actually getting kids to apply phonics and also see themselves as successful. Um, for example, a teacher that I talked to in Michigan, she started using just one decodable a week with her kindergartners because she was pretty um, hesitant, not sure that it was the right way to go. And she noticed that her children's confidence and word attack in all texts suddenly exploded because they suddenly were able to see themselves as readers because they knew, I know how to read words. Um, I'm not just in this like mystery context where I have to rely on all sorts of other things to try to figure out what's going on. You said that was just one text a week. It was. Yeah. And that's just that's an amazing. anecdotal story mm -hmm. um, from yeah. a teacher. So I think that most people in research right now and would suggest <laughs> that probably more than one, right. if you can handle yeah. it, but if you're, but even often, that one made a difference for her, maybe think about it. Like if you, if you really have, if you've heard this out there, and you're like, have, um, first off, I would say check any judgment you have of decodables. If you hear that word and you want to throw up, uh, <laughs> give a chance to find some better ones. They're not all about the rat on the mat with his hat. Um, I know, and I then, know, I know. <laughs> I have to tell you yeah, guys a yeah. quick story. So I, Please. you know, I worked at the district level and because I was secondary, I don't, I don't deal with decodables quite often, but for some reason I was helping somebody type up some decodables and I don't know where they came from or anything. It doesn't matter. Um, but I remember typing them and just looking over and going, what is this? Like, what? There's no story here. Like, these are just nonsense. <laughs> I, I remember so, you you texted me and you're like so what, annoyed. what are these these like, things these and you're like reading. Saying, <laughs> yeah. because it was just that yeah. right? it was just words that you know had had similar patterns and they rhymed and it didn't matter what the what it what it said it was just like 
these are the words we need to put them in a story. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I know they, I think they've gotten a bad rap for that reason over time. Right, right, right. <laughs> I will say though, uh, Julia, to compliment the story that you just shared, um, over the pandemic, uh, my daughter Presley was in second grade at the be- beginning of the pandemic. So we went through and I had her reading the geodes texts and they complimented what she was doing, um, in wind wisdom. And obviously this was like with me and, because we didn't know what we were doing for school. And it was just kind of like, oh, what's going on? So I had her reading um, the geodes, I'd say every day. I was like, you know, part of part of your work each day is going to be reading the geodes decodable text. And uh, you're going to be doing this bit of wit and wisdom. And she was so hungry for those decodables that she, she would be reading three and four a day. I mean, she'd read the same one four or five times. And then when she got to third grade, she's like, and and where are the geodes? I said, there's not, there's not, there's not geodes for third grade. You already mastered all the things that you need. You don't need these anymore. (laughs) And she goes, but I do. Who do you work with? Who do you work with that we can call to get more geodes? (laughs) I don't think it's like that, but it it does. And and I know, you know, another one of our friends had a similar story with, with her son, um, it does build their confidence so much. And that's what I think I saw the biggest takeaway in is that she felt so empowered. I saw that also transfer over into her independent reading. And, you know, of course she, she did have the, the phonics skills that she needed, the foundational skills to access, but the practice was really important. And I I think if, if it gives kids that confidence and, and it's just, you know, stories that we're sharing just informally, um, it, it's worthy of a try for anyone out there. Like decodables have, um, I I don't know. I feel like we can say like decodables 2.0, they've morphed into these Mm -hmm. really amazing texts. You just have to be a conscious consumer, right? That's what I'm hearing you say. Yes, absolutely. Conscious consuming is critical here. Um, so I love what you're saying about geodes as well and bringing them up because I think that that and decodables 2.0, because that really brings us to talking about, so what's the better version of decodables? If it's not a rat on a mat with a cat, <laughs> uh, what should we be looking for when That's, we're trying to find What should we look decodables? for? <laughs> yes, yes. So um, this is actually a big body of my personal research and what I've kind of worked on um, over the past several years and continue to work on um, with various districts, publishing companies, um, nonprofit organizations, really trying to get people to think more broadly about what's possible in a decodable. So in research, we call these multiple criteria texts, which is like the least catchy phrase I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. But what that basically means is texts that were written to adhere to more than one criteria about how we know kids learn to read. Um, and so we know from research that decodability is one part of that. So having kids actually apply letter sign relationships is an important part of word recognition. We also know that high-frequency words are really important. So having lots of high-frequency words that kids have been taught um, and taught in a way where they understand even the strange ways that those letters map onto sounds. And then we also know some other things that are very rarely attended to in a lot of texts, but are in some. So some of these things are things like word repetition, but not phrase repetition. So we know that children need um, somewhere between one and eight, maybe more, maybe less. I mean, not less than one, hopefully, but (laughs) at bats with a word to really start solidifying their orthographic map of that word and to start being able to recognize a word automatically. Oh, that's perfect. I was going to ask you to define that word. So (laughs) yeah, great. (laughs) You just did it. Great. (laughs) Perfect. So if they have um, the ability to see a word and or parts of words that are fairly stable over and over again that helps solidify their ability to understand generalizable patterns in our language and also to automatically recognize specific words. Uh, That's different than having a phrase repeated where we're essentially asking them to memorize a phrase and repeat. Uh, That does not lead to the same level of memory that we have when we're decoding a word. Uh, It also is just, like I've said before, really inefficient because if we had to memorize all the words we need to know, that would take forever. (laughs) So yeah, 
Yeah. That's such a good point. <laughs> and that's, I, I want to talk about sight words, but not right now, like keep okay. going and then we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> we also know though, there are other things in text that are helpful to be thinking about that are supportive of word recognition and also of a kid's ability to comprehend the text. Mm-hmm. So remember that the goal here is never to create phonics fact networks. And it's not even really to create kids who could read bizarro sentences like zip zap, zip bat. Like, what does that mean? (laughs) If if a kid can read that, like, okay. And so if you think about a text as a whole and thinking about how can we make sure that the kid is recognizing words and also making meaning, um, we can consider some other factors that are, again, often missed when people have been creating these texts in the past, but there are people who are doing it now. So some of those things are, are the words in a text familiar and understandable to a child? Can they create a mental image of these words in a text? Do they have some familiarity with them because they are matched to what we know children experience, the content that they're learning in other times of day, or their cultural and linguistic backgrounds? And then if we look beyond just individual words, we can think about that in a text as a whole. So texts that are interesting to children are more uh, lead them to persist longer. This is like one of the coolest, I think, findings from research ever, is that if a kid is interested in a text, they will keep reading and keep trying, even if the words get harder and harder and harder. So if we have yeah. texts that are really interesting, and if we have texts that are linked to a child's um, knowledge so that they can actually understand what's going on, they're actually going to have a better experience reading and also have a better understanding of what's going on and be able to m- answer more complex comprehension questions. Um, so just to backpedal a little bit, we also know that a child who is reading a text that reflects their cultural knowledge is more likely to understand what's going on. And again, is more likely to understand individual words. So we need to think about these things as a whole. So is a text, um, interesting? Is it engaging? Is it matched to this child's knowledge about the world and about themselves? All of these things are critical to think about in decodables, not because they're um, things that are hot topics to talk about right now, but they are and they should be. But because we actually know that this is a way to support better readers. And so even if um, sometimes those things seem like really hard to think about and hard to access, it's really critical that we start bringing that understanding into the early literacy space because we're actually doing a disservice to the students in our classroom if we're not giving them text that they have the ability to see themselves in and that they have the ability to understand because of their own cultural knowledge. Just like, you know, if you have a child in um, a rural area, you wouldn't only give them text about New York City if you have a child in New York City, you shouldn't only give them texts about a farm. They can certainly learn things that aren't in their experiences, but giving children the uh, opportunity to read texts that are in their experience and that are decodable is actually both possible and helpful for their eventual reading development. And I'll just plug one resource now for this um, is my own website. It's called beyonddecodables.com. And in this uh, website are housed texts that were written for the Boston public schools that are still used in Boston and that adhere to a lot of these criteria. They're decodable. They have lots of high frequency words. There's word repetition across text and they're matched to kids perceived cultural knowledge and they're matched to the content that kids often are learning in science and social studies. In this case, they're directly matched to Boston's curriculum. But even if you don't use that curriculum, you'll find texts that are matched to things that we typically teach in this case in first grade. And so kids have the opportunity to build knowledge in these texts, while also um, if you are in a similar context like Boston, they might feel like they see themselves represented. If you're not in a place like Boston, then they might have the chance to learn something new about a different group of kids and group of people. So thinking about all of these aspects in decodables and not just thinking about decodability is one way that you can ensure kids are making meaning, not just being decoders. That's a very long-winded answer to your question. You like blew my mind a little bit there. I'm gonna have to, (laughs) (laughs) because when I, you know, I I know geodes probably the best is decodable. So when I thought of those, I always thought these are really nice because they're they're decodables, but they have like the meaning behind them and they're connected to the knowledge from what they're getting in in wisdom. um, And they're still building their vocabulary and then, and that's great. But what I didn't think about was what you just said of like, 
you know, we want them to have that productive struggle as they are reading these, right? Like it might not be super easy for them to decode and that the, the having that knowledge of, of uh, their own knowledge or connected to what they're learning helps them actually push through that productive struggle. That is like, <laughs> gave me a little bit of goosebumps there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And I, 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 can I, like I said, I we need in? more texts like this, but um, we, there are some places to go to get things like this now. And you can use kind of that as a bar as well to look for other ty- types of texts that are getting close. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Julia, I actually pulled up um, your site and I'm, looking at one that I thought I, I would categorize as, and, and I don't, I don't know how you would categorize it, but I would say highly decodable. It's 97% decodable, but also, and I'm looking at the parameters on, on your website that you've coded out. Um, and those, those pieces are connected to content, highly decodable, high frequency words, natural syntax and language, repeated words and word parts, and familiar, meaningful, and relevant. So I was thinking this would be like a highly decodable and also familiar, meaningful, and relevant, the one that, uh, in addition to probably other ones, right? But I'm just calling it out for listeners. It's called Recess. And um, can I read like a very little snippet of it? Sure. Okay. It's going to be hard because I didn't do it the right way. Like I didn't print it out and then put it together as a book, you know? Oh, you could open the digital version. Another plug, you should open do that. the digital okay. version and then it goes the right page to page that you would see on a screen. Or if you open the print version, that's the type of book that you can double-sided print and then fold. Oh my gosh. Now I'm totally stuck and I have to get back to it. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. This is, but this is a great resource. I think for anyone listening, um, who, who I know we have listeners who don't always, um, have a high quality curricula, right? And so there's, there's some questions around what, what do we, what do I do? What do I do for decodables? Cause I, I'm not quite sure how to support students in accessing it. And this is a, a really cool resource for, uh, for folks who might be listening, who are eagerly awaiting high quality materials. <laughs> yeah. And it's absolutely free. And there's also some lesson planning, um, kind of helps sort of templates on there as well. Cause you might be thinking when in the world am I supposed to do this? Um, well, my suggestion would be to take some small groups, um, and to use decodables with them and see what you notice. Um, if it's your first time trying it out and ideally looking at some of the templates like that are on my website or from other people's resources that remind us that we shouldn't just swap out a decodable for a guided reading text. We need to be intentional yeah. about continuing to support kids and recognizing And now we're using phonics to read um, by reminding them about what we're doing so that we aren't bearing the lead there. So that's um, saying to kids, here's phonics, here's reading. So let's just make it more transparent for them. We all have probably noticed that not all kids, but some kids just do not remember what happened in the morning once we get to the (laughs) afternoon. Um, So to expect them to remember you know, uh, that we use phonics to read without ever telling them that is kind of unfair. So let's just make that transparent for kids. And right before we start reading, remind them of what we're doing in, um, some of my dissertation work. This was something that we noticed is that teachers who in the moment, right before, and while kids were reading decodables, very explicitly reminded kids of what they had just learned in phonics had children who had better outcomes so just remembering that we um, should just like tell kids, telling kids something is not taking the fun out of it. It's actually just giving them the information that they need to succeed. I think it's giving them information and empowering them. Like mm-hmm. the word is there and, and we just learned how to do this. Like, I just feel like kids feel so empowered once they look at that word, they're like, oh yeah, I do kind of know how to do this, you know? Um, can I read? A, uh, I pulled it back up. I got it in digital yes. format. Can I do a little bit? Okay. Sure. Uh, so I remember it was high decodability. And also, I feel like this just connects to kiddos. So let's get up for recess, says Miss Lynn. Jad gets up and runs. Liv hops. Max sits back. Jad and Liv play tag. Jad and Liv have fun. Max sits. Jad checks on Max. Jad says, Max, will you get up? Melissa, do you want to guess what the focus was there for that one? Oh, Melissa's going to go crazy. I know. I'm putting you on the spot. 
I'm not going to lie. I was looking at other texts while you were reading that one. <laughs> oh, that's fine. You weren't, like, you weren't hanging on every word of the, the Dakota book. No. <laughs> it was, I believe it was CVC, correct? Yes, with digraphs. Yeah. With digraphs, yeah. Perfect. So just a little example if anybody's listening and thinking, oh, what can I do for decodables? <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. So we have, you know, some options out there for you to explore and see what kind of fits with what you're doing in your classroom otherwise. Well, now we're all distracted. We're all like, like I, I Melissa know. Now I'm on your totally website. Googling. Let me stop. Let me stop. <laughs> but we will link um, your website so that people can access it in our show notes. So great. And if yes, you, I've got my list. <laughs> yeah. And if you decide to try it out and something great happens, uh, I would love an email. You can always reach out to me. Uh, I think there's also just contact forms on the website that you can get me at. Um, but I'm sure they can throw my email down below as well. Uh, but it's just Julia at beyond So it's kind of easy to remember. And yeah, I'd love to hear what experiences you have, or if you have questions, um, I, I do always respond to people's inquiries on the website. So, um, would love to hear about positive or confusing stories either way that they go awesome awesome thank you all right melissa that was a pretty incredible episode with julia wasn't it it absolutely was but you know we just couldn't stop talking to her <laughs> no, there's there's actually a whole what 45 more minutes to listen to we're going to release yeah. one more episode next week we had to break this one into a two-parter because we thought we could digest it so our literacy lovers could digest it and then be ready for more next week, right? Yeah, we just kept picking her brain because she was <laughs> full of knowledge. <laughs> I know we promised we promised to talk about sound walls. We didn't even get to sound walls this week. We, but will, we will in part pick two. up on that next week. And if though, if if literacy lovers are l- interested in learning about sound walls, check out our newsletter because there's going to be some information about sound walls, um, some articles about them, some examples of them, as well as lots of other good stuff and a a link to uh, the decodables that Julia talks about in the episode. So be sure to check out that newsletter. Melissa, where can they find it? I was just about to tell them. (laughs) um, At our website, um, literacypodcast.com, it'll pop right up with a place where you can sign up for our newsletter. Cool. All right. See you next week. See you next week with Julia. (laughs) 